guys. Good morning. Uh, so, a couple of announcements I'd like to make this morning. I'm glad to see that everybody made it to class. Um, sorry about all the confusion, um, but I'm glad that we're all here. And we have a big class today. That's awesome. Uh, I guess there's no rain, right? But, um, and there's a quiz. So, uh, I do want to make a couple of, of announcements. Um, I had some of my online students, and I, I really tried to work with them a lot, but um, they asked me if we could push the L2 back one day. Okay, so uh, it was due tonight, so September 10th at 11.55. I'm going to now make it due tomorrow night. Okay, so that would be September 11th, so Saturday, September 11th at 11.55. Okay, so it will be due tomorrow night. The L3... Um, I had it up there for quite some time, but it was due on Monday. Of course, we haven't done any of Chapter 3 yet. Um, we're going to do a little bit today. But, uh, of course, we won't have it all finished by Monday. So the test is going to be the test for the um, in-class people, the 14.06-01, uh, all of you guys that are watching me right now. Um, that test is going to be held Friday. Okay, the online test, of course, is uh, being held um, Wednesday and Thursday. But um, what we'll do is make the HAL 3 homework do the same day as the test, okay? Or actually, day after the test. We'll make it do um, next Saturday, and I believe that's Saturday the 18th, okay? Yeah, so that would be the 18th. So if there's any questions, let me know after class, but... The test will be next Friday, and that will be over chapters 1, 2, and 3. Okay? And the OWL homework that was due tonight is now due tomorrow night. And the OWL homework that was due on Monday is now due next Saturday, the 18th. Okay? Well, you know, I mean, if you're five OWL sections ahead or whatever, you know, yeah. it's no big deal. <laughs> okay? Um, so that being said... I'd like to uh, do a, 20, a small 20-minute lecture right now before I give the quiz, and uh, we can start on some of Chapter 3 stuff so you guys can get some information so you can start doing Chapter 3 homework, okay, over the weekend. I'd hate to have you have a lost week. So anyways, uh, Chapter 3, Electronic Structure and Periodic Law. Um, so essentially we're going to be talking about the periodic table and why it's set up in the way that it's set up. Okay, so there's this guy, this is a, a painting of this guy, obviously it's not a picture of him, he looks quite, quite different, well, not less austere uh, in, his, in his pictures, but um, in that painting he looks quite grandiose or whatever, but this guy, his name is Dmitry Mendeleev. Uh, he developed the modern periodic table, so this thing that you see over here. Um, he introduced the concept that uh, properties of the elements are periodic functions of their atomic weights. So what does that mean, periodic functions? That means that whenever you see an atomic, uh, or an atom that is actually placed in the periodic table, what you can see is that they're placed in like columns here. Mm -hmm. And all of those columns, uh, within one of those columns, so if we look at these guys here, nitrogen, phosphorus, uh, acetane, um, and so on, we uh, see that all, all of these have similar chemical properties. Okay? So in other words, it's periodic function. So every time you go to that column, right, they have similar chemical properties, okay? So we call those columns families, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So in reality, the properties of the elements are actually functions of their atomic numbers. So the atomic number is what you see here. For hydrogen, it's one. So the number that's in the top right corner there, two. For oxygen, it's eight. Sulfur is 16, okay? Uh, these atomic numbers describe how many protons are actually located in the nucleus, okay? Um, okay, uh, this is an expanded version of the periodic table taking the F block, which is down here, and uh, inserting it 
and the place in the periodic table where it should be, which is right there. So after 57 and 89. Um, and again, respect to the chemical properties. Okay, so let's talk about the elements of the periodic table, the atomic number. So let's look at carbon. Okay, carbon is atomic number six. Remember, the atomic number describes the number of protons in the nucleus. The symbol for carbon is C, so right there. The name, of course, all elements have a name. All elements have a symbol. All elements have a number of protons in their nucleus. And the atomic mass of uh, carbon is, actually this should say AMU after it, because the units for atomic mass are AMU. Sometimes you'll see U. I can't remember what our book does, if it's U or AMU. Does it do AMU? Yeah, I prefer AMU. Um, I really should have put some units after that. But anyways, the atomic mass here is found on the periodic table up here, usually below the symbol of the element. Okay? And that describes how what is the average mass of any carbon atom that you'll find. Okay? So again, how I implied before, uh, these columns here are known as families or groups. Uh, and they have similar properties. Uh, this, this is uh, showing a picture of the different halogens. In fact, this is chlorine here. This uh, picture here is describing bromine. And this picture here is describing iodine. Uh, notice uh, that they're all diatomic uh, elements. Okay, so if you can see the picture, each one of these has uh, composed of two atoms stuck together. <coughs> and when they increase in mass, right, we go from a gas to partial liquid to more of a salt. Okay, but the properties of these elements are very, very similar to each other. In fact, their reactive nature is what you really want to think of as being the most similar. Um, here's another uh, family of elements. Um, uh, magnesium here, <coughs> uh, calcium and strontium. Notice their, the nature of uh, the way that they're in this metal C that we will eventually describe, um, but notice the kind of shape and um, chemical or physical properties of them being similar. Those are all the 2A elements there, so these guys. Again, they have similar chemical properties. So some of the common family names that I'd like you to know are uh, group 1A, this group here, this is the alkali metals. Group 2A is the alkaline earth metals. I want you to know these because when I say alkaline metals, I want you to know what group I'm talking about. Okay. Uh, and then group 8 or group 18 over here, group 8A or group 18, uh, we call these the noble gases. Uh, their name implies, uh, I guess, nobility. This is because the, of their um, place in the periodic table and their actual electronic structure uh, this electronic structure uh, that they have actually gives them a very, very stable um, structure, atomic structure. So, in fact, that they don't react with any other elements, okay? Which is why they have the moniker, if you will, noble, okay? So that's why you call them noble, because they're always turning their nose up at all the other elements. And then we've got a uh, group of very reactive elements called the halogens here. Okay, that's the halogens. Uh, and again, they all have similar properties. If you've ever heard of halogen headlights or whatever, this is where that term is. Okay. So uh, we described the groups and families here. Okay. But there's another uh, periodic function uh, to this uh, table here, and that's the periods themselves. So we call uh, the, the horizontal line here a period. So if you see, we've got period one contains these two elements, hydrogen and helium. Period two contains these eight elements, 
Period 3 contains these 8 elements. Period 4 contains these 18, 5, 18, and then 6, you have to include these F block too. So it gets more and more and more as you go down. Okay. So those are the periods. There's regions of this periodic table that aren't really described on this one that we have here, uh, this big version of it, but if you look at the slide, uh, you can kind of see uh, there's a difference in color in the different regions of the periodic table. Notice this purple region covers most of the periodic table. Okay, so that's almost all the elements. Those are the metals. Okay. Anything that's purple in there is a metal. So this is an element that is relatively shiny and malleable. Malleable is if I take a hammer, I can pound it into a sheet. Okay, so that's what malleable means. Uh, and they conduct both heat and electricity. Some of the metals obviously conduct that stuff better than other metals. Um, like I was telling some of, or a couple of you this morning, I found out that my cap conducts electricity in my tooth pretty well. Well, because I just got it put on last week, and I was trying to eat with silverware, and it zapped me every time. So, <laughs> yeah, so now I eat with plastic forks in there. <laughs> okay. So, um, those are all metals, right? They conduct electricity, conduct heat, all that good, good fun stuff. Um, notice the other two regions of the periodic table are very, very small compared to that big metal region. Okay? The, uh, the next region I would like to describe is the non-metals. This is shown in green here. Those are elements that lack metallic properties. So, kind of opposite properties of the metals. So, where we're going to learn about covalent and ionic bonding and that sort of business, the metals all participate in ionic bonding. There's very few exceptions where you'll find them participating in covalent bonding. Every once in a while you will. But, and those are usually the smaller metals up here. But for a general rule of thumb, anything you're going to see in this class, ionic bonding for metals. Okay? Non-metals, on the other hand, can participate in both ionic and covalent bonding. And it all depends on what they're bonding with. If a non-metal bonds with a non-metal, then it will participate in covalent bonding. If a non-metal binds with a metal, it will participate in ionic bonding. And the difference between ionic and covalent bonding, ionic is the transfer of electrons from one element to another, and covalent is the sharing of electrons from one element to another. We'll really get into this, uh, into the meat of this later uh, next week, probably on Monday. Okay, so if you don't understand, it's no big deal. But anyways, let's look at a couple more regions. Uh, the yellow here, these are the metalloids. Okay, so those are elements that have properties in between a metal and a non-metal. Uh, and then the transition metals. So these metals over here, these metals uh, in this region here, those are called the main group metals. Okay, these metals here in this little block here, or big block, I guess, those are called the transition metals. Yeah, and they have inherently different ionic bonding capabilities and properties. Okay, so that's why we kind of separate uh, our thinking about them. Okay, and again, we'll get into more of that later. Okay, so let's try to identify the group and period of some elements. So if we look at calcium, which is Ca, oh, and I'm never going to make you memorize the names or symbols of an element. I'll always give you the periodic tables that you guys see in front of you right now that have those names and symbols. If you don't have one yet, uh, there should be a pack of them coming around, uh, and you can get one. I don't think you'll need it for quiz one, okay? Cause it, if you work. If you do, I'll tell you what it is, okay? Um, anyways, so let's identify uh, the group and period of calcium. So calcium is CA, so we got to look for it on the periodic table. Okay, there it is. So we know its atomic number, remember its atomic number is shown in the top right corner there, that's 20. The atomic number describes what? What does it describe again? The number of protons in the nucleus, okay? 
In a neutral atom, so any of these atoms that you see on the periodic table here, as a neutral atom, uh, those uh, numbers also describe the amount of electrons that atom has, right? Uh, so here, calcium's got 20 electrons, 20 protons. Uh, and notice it's in the group 2A, or we call these the alkaline earth metals. And notice it's in period 4. Okay, so hopefully you guys can describe that. Cool. Okay, so let's start talking about the electron configuration. So I know we went over all of that, protons, neutrons, and electrons in chapter 2. But um, So let's talk about, if we can get on that slide. Okay. Electron configuration. Okay. So electron configuration is the arrangement of these electrons in atomic orbitals. So remember we described the electrons as being circling around the nucleus. Okay. So this is a kind of not really accurate picture of what an atom looks like, but a way that we can kind of start to describe it. And then we'll expand our knowledge of what it looks like later. Um, when we understand more about it. So uh, the electron configuration is the arrangement of electrons in the atomic orbitals. So there's this guy called Bohr. Uh, his model talked about circling uh, electrons around the nucleus in an atomic orbital. So, okay, so you can think about it like this. Uh, we got one orbital here, a higher energy orbital there, higher energy orbital there, and a higher energy orbital there. Okay. The higher the, the energy of the orbital would be, the further the orbital is away from the nucleus. Of course, the electrons are negatively charged, the nucleus is positively charged, so they really want to be closer together. So the further away they are, the higher in energy you can think they are. The more smack they could have if they were going to hit each other. Okay. Um, so these electrons could be raised or lowered in energy level due to energy absorbed or released. So if I pumped a bunch of energy into this uh, atom, I can make the electrons jump up and down into these en different energy levels. Okay, so this model was revised in 1929. So, well, almost 100 years ago now. Uh, and, uh, or 1926, sorry. And instead of circular orbital orbitals, uh, the location and energy of electrons moving around the nucleus is now defined by using three specific terms. The shell, the subshell, and the atomic orbital. Okay. So, um, so this whole thing would be a shell. Okay, so the location of all of these different regions, okay, all of these different uh, electrons here, so you see, so you got the shell is the big thing. The subshell is this 4f or 4d or 4p or 4s. The orbital, see the 4p has three orbitals in it. And an electron would be one of these dots. Okay? So this is just a picture of building up electron configurations. Okay? Uh, so let's just, we'll... We'll do a couple of these and just stop at this uh, slide and get ready for the quiz. But um, let's build up the electron configurations of the first five elements, for example. Okay. So the way I would really like to draw this picture. The way I'd like to draw this picture is to put an arrow pointing up. And that describes the change in energy. Okay? So if we're going to try to draw the picture of hydrogen, okay? Uh, hydrogen only has one electron, okay? And its electron is in the electron shell that is the first period up there. Okay? So its shell is actually the, the S shell, and in fact, um, its subshell is going to be the 1s. There's only one subshell in the s level. Okay, so you can describe it as a box like that. 
So I guess we should say that the uh, subshells are S, then it goes to P, which is greater than in, in energy than S, then it goes to D, then it goes to F. Okay? And if we look here, <coughs> these are all the S subshells in these first two groups here. Okay, then it jumps over to here. These are the P subshells here. And then the D subshells is in the middle here, the transition metals, and then the F subshells. We'll really be only concentrating on the S and the P's in this class, okay? And again, you may think this is all crazy right now, you don't understand anything, but in about, uh, by the weekend is over, you'll figure it out, I promise you. Okay, so the way to build up, way to build up these electrons is to show each one of these atoms gaining one more electron each time, right? So, put one electron in there to describe hydrogen. So, hydrogen, if we look at the periodic table, has one proton and one electron. So we only want to put one little line. An electron is usually described by uh, what we call a fish hook arrow, a half-sided arrow, okay? So if we're going to describe the electron configuration of helium, helium has two electrons in it. So what we'll do is put another fish hook arrow like that. Okay? When the electrons are in the same orbital, remember every one of these boxes is an orbital. Okay? So the whole thing here is the shell. The 1s that's the subshell. This box is the orbital. And these lines here describe the electron. Okay. So that's helium. And uh, what you'll notice is that only two electrons can occupy an orbital at once. Okay, so the first two atoms have electrons that occupy the same orbital. Okay? Um, let's stop there. Uh, I know this probably, we're just starting it, so it might be a little confusing. We'll do a bunch of these on Monday, okay? And you will, I promise you, you will have no problem with it. Yeah, so the left side over there is S. S. P E F. Yeah. So what will happen? Look, what will happen here is you'll build up your electrons going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, like that. That's it. Just goes by the periodic nature of these elements.